So, um, we need to back up a minute. Before we start Minister's Black Veil, before we hopefully do Minister's Black Veil, turn to pages 72 and 73. Um, because if, if, I'm, if I'm wrong, if you guys remember, or if you've got notes or whatever, tell me. But I think I completely skipped in going over the terms. These, um, these terms about plot. Uh, 72, you got exposition, rising action, and then on 73, you've got several terms, okay? And it, it begins talking about a passage from um, Burroughs' Tarzan. Episode begins with exposition. The background information a reader needs to make sense of the situation in which the characters are placed. What exposition is missing from the minister's black veil? What background information would you really like to have? I've been teaching this story for close to 30 years. I still, part of me, I mean, I've got a pretty good reason exactly why he does what he does, but I don't have it 100%. What would it be nice to know about Parson Hooper? Why? Why does he put on the veil? It's, you know, I don't like doing percentages thing, but you could say, you know, it's 75, 90% answered at the very end of the story. But even then, I think it's safe to ask what triggered him to do that? You know, when we get to the story, he's going to say something. Well, what triggered him to come to that conclusion, okay? The morning that he puts the veil on, or maybe the day before. I mean, if, if we take a story as being, you know, like a, a snapshot or a short video of real life, what happened the morning before that made him say, you know what? I think I'm going to wear a black veil to church and I'm going to deliver the whole sermon. We're going to do the whole service with me wearing this black veil. And in fact, I'm never going to take the veil off again. So that even his fiance ditches him. You know, she's like, "If you love me, take it off him one more time." He's like, "Nope, not going to have it, it. Not you know anything else." Okay. So exposition is just again that background information. You know, um, in the Harry Potter novels, or I'm, you know, I make references to those all the time because I teach other classes largely on, on those. Rowling delivers that exposition, that background information, throughout all seven novels. She kind of just dribbles it out, bit by bit, so that we come to the understanding that everybody in the story comes to when they come to that same understanding. So it's kind of like we're when you read those stories, you're walking along and experiencing everything exactly like Harry does. We don't, you know, suddenly know a lot of stuff that the characters in the story don't know, all right? You know, when we talked about irony the other day, one of the things about irony, you know, when the audience knows something that the characters in the story don't. So, for example, I'm going to give away something kind of big, I guess. Um... For when we get to Sophocles. When, when Sophocles wrote his Oedipus cycle, his three plays about the character of Oedipus, King of Thebes and such, his audience knew all about the story of Oedipus. Why? Because it was an old myth. It was like if somebody in, in 500 uh, BC Greece were to write something about you know, the hero Odysseus, Ulysses, or Achilles. Well, they knew all that because of the stories, the myths, you know, of Homer and such, okay? So when, in, when you know, the play opens and Oedipus says, I'm trying not to give too much away here. When Oedipus says, you know, if so-and-so isn't found, let this curse fall upon me. The audience is totally aware, uh-oh, that curse is going to fall totally upon him. He's totally oblivious to that, okay? That's an example of that kind of irony. They don't need... The exposition. It, the audience does it for that play. 
in ancient Greece. They know it all, okay? We do. We, if you've come, come to that play for the first time, we don't know that background. So what Sophocles does is he wisely, he doesn't write the play solely for his own audience. He's writing it for others at the same time. But he also, you know, he's got this broad general myth. He fills in little particular details that they may not be entirely familiar with, okay? So it's just the background that gets put forward. And the description that we have here is you get the exposition, and then you have, what's the next term? Rising action, isn't it? Yeah. The rising action. Okay. So exposition is on this side of the pyramid. Here's the beginning. Here's I can write an e, the end. And this is the climax of the story. So the rising action begins with you know, the complication. Conflict has to be introduced, all right? Um, rising action, complication that intensifies the situation. What's the complication? What's the rising action in the minister's black veil? How does it intensify the situation? I mean, you could say the specific complication is when he shows up, doesn't even show up. When people see him leave the personage and start walking towards the church and he's got something covering his face. That, that starts giving all the people who attend the church, which by the way, this time period, or when it's kind of set, is everybody. You know, Early America had laws requiring you to attend church. Medieval Renaissance England laws requiring. Tithe wasn't something you chose to give. It was required and such. So they see him start coming, and they kind of start getting the willies because they don't understand this, right? Um, next page, conflict. Everybody knows what conflict is. It's when two things don't get along, okay? Conflict can be caused by a person, right? I mean, what is the, the great conflict in the first three, the original three Star Wars films? Who's it between? Is it between Han Solo and Darth Vader? Nope, Han Solo's insignificant. It's between Luke and Darth Vader. It's not even between Obi-Wan, okay? Between Luke and Darth Vader, right? Conflict can be caused not by a person. It can be caused by something impersonal. It can be caused by an idea. It can be caused by time. Right? I mean, think of the image, uh, an image kind of used popularly to depict one's life. Imagine this is not a bottle of water, but an um, hourglass. And you're born, and whoever tips over the hourglass. What starts to happen? That sign, that sign sand or grain, whatever they are, slowly start to fall. And what happens as it gets closer and closer to the waist of the hourglass? It's like the sand moves faster, right? Guess what? The older you are, the faster time does seem to move. Why? You're getting closer and closer and closer to the grave. Generally, generally, People in their teens and early 20s think what about time in relation to life? Your life is what? Entirely ahead of you. It's not true, literally. Part of your life is behind you. And it could end up being that half of your life is behind you. You know, something happens and you die at 40. Or it could be, you know, a hell of a lot worse and something happens and you die the next day. Totally unexpected. Okay, so lots of things can be the conflict. Foreshadowing, everybody knows what foreshadowing is. It's when an author gives a clue, a hint, as to something that's going to happen later in the story. Uh, protagonist, hero. We talked about protagonist. I had up here protos, agonist. First or chief, 
suffer. Notice, protagonist doesn't mean hero. What do we think? How do you define the word hero? I, not literary, just in real life. Define hero. Or, if you don't want to define, give me an example. Who's a hero? What is a hero? Like Superman and Batman. Superman, Batman. What word do we usually use? What do we add before the word hero for them? Super. Superhero. Why? Say it again. Because they're super. Because they're super. What does super mean? From Latin, it means above, higher. So they're an above hero. They're a higher hero. How? Well, you can't really put Superman and Batman in the same category. Why? One has powers, he can fly. And the other one has gadgets. I mean, Batman can do all the push-ups and crunches, etc. in the world. He can't fly. He's not faster than a speeding bullet. He can't leap over tall buildings. And he can't fly. So we'll just keep going back to that part. He doesn't shoot you know, rays out of his eyes. He doesn't have x-ray vision. He's Mark Zuckerberg without being a nerd and transform him into, you know, Hulk or whatever. He's just a brainy guy who designs all kinds of gadgets. Okay? Why are they heroes? They save people. They save people. Is Gotham Batman's problem? Bruce Wayne's problem? No, it's not his problem. Is Earth Superman's problem? No, not really. He could go on, be fat, dumb, and happy, living as Clark Kent or, you know, farm boy in the middle of Kansas or whatever it is he, he grows up. But what do each of them do? They take on those problems. Okay, so let's go outside the world of superhero and that kind of myth to real heroes. What's a real hero? Police, firefighters. Police, firefighters, okay. EMTs, nurses, doctors, some would say. When COVID began, well, I take that back. A couple months after COVID began, you could drive by, I would argue, but this is probably safe to say, every hospital in the United States. And what would you see outside? A sign that says, heroes work here. Why? They put their lives on the line. Now, I'm going to get real nitpicky. My daughter's an ICU nurse. She got her degree, started being an ICU nurse in July of 2020. I mean, thrown into the fire, okay? Um, is doing what is expected of you, expected of you heroic? No. No. This is why I said I'm going to be really nitpicky. A lot of people, you know, disagree, don't like me saying this. A doctor saving someone's life is doing what? The job he or she is trained to do and paid to do. Okay. A fireman, don't mean to be sexist, but I'm just old. A fireman who runs into a burning, burning building is literally doing what? he or she is expected to do. Okay? A fireman running into a collapsing burning building, is that still the same as well, just doing his or her job? No. Because usually at that point, the chief, if the chief is on the you know, ground, will say, everybody out. You know? Because you don't, you're not required as a fireman to literally put your life on the line for somebody else. I mean, if it's a you know, five alarm fire, they'll be out there hosing everything down, but you know, if the entire building is engulfed, they will not send in firefighters. And yet, you can read almost monthly stories of firefighters who will go. I mean, go back to 9-11. 300 some, 346, I think, firefighters saw what was going on at 
Twin Towers. And they ran two the fire. Even as the buildings, you know, start to crumble, there's some of them are still going towards. That's heroic. Why? That's going above and beyond. Somebody who joins the military and goes and fights off, fights in a war, Iraq, Afghanistan, pick your war. That's not, by its pure definition, heroic. That's you're doing the job you agree to do. Right? All volunteer army, I'm not talking about Vietnam, because that was a draft, but today. But if you see a group of kids and you notice where those group of kids are playing, something on the ground that doesn't look right, IED, and you run and you jump on it, you do whatever, that's not at all required. Okay? That's heroic. So protagonist doesn't necessarily mean hero. Protagonist, you know, the better thing that's used there is the central character. We're gonna, you know, we're gonna do a play. Just a minute, hold, hold your thought. We're gonna do a play that it's not going to be exactly clear. I will argue who the protagonist is. Usually, if you have a play named after somebody, that person is the protagonist. I'll tell you right now. When we get to the play Antigone, about Oedipus's daughter, I think it can be argued that Antigone is not the central character. I mean, yeah, she's in every scene, so to speak, but there's another character who suffers more than she does. And in that sense, that character is the protagonist, the chief sufferer. Question? Um, so I understand like, the difference between protagonist and hero, but as far as hero, do you think soldier or doctor or whatever could, I guess, technically Chose to do that profession? Like when they could have just chosen to be. Yeah, I think, that's, I, I think one can make that argument easily. You know, uh, my brother in law is ex cop. He was a cop for 27 years, small town, Northern California, you know, pot growing country. So, I mean, he had to deal with, you know, addicts and dealers and stuff. And not just, you know, your, your for lack of a better phrase, average, everyday, ordinary, you know, pot dealer. He had to deal with the guys who would have pot, you know, groves and walking around armed with semi-automatics. I mean, for a while he worked as a narc, narcotics, okay? And I mean, full undercover and all that kind of stuff, you know? When he signed up to be a cop, went to the Air Force to, you know, get military kind of training and stuff, he wasn't necessarily thinking, yeah, and then I want to become old reference, and then you'll probably get it, Serpico, you know, this, this cop who and, you know, did all this kind of stuff um, undercover. So, yeah, I mean, if, if but again, it depends, because you can, you know, decide to become a doctor and not serve, so to speak, on the front lines, like an ER doctor. You can be a doctor and say, I want to have my nice, cushy little clinic over here where I see people nine to five, and the people generally don't have bad diseases. They come in with a sore throat, an earache, an owie, and I, you know, whatever. I'm not saying, I'm not belittling, the, you know, like my doctor, I'm not belittling that at all. But that's not the same, for example, as an ER doctor who has to deal, you know, maybe in a large city, with GSWs, day in and day out, stabbings, terrorists, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, so, yeah, very easily. And same with nurses, okay? You know, and again, COVID kind of redefined all that. You know, I'm old enough, I remember, you know, growing up in California, you know, when the AIDS epidemic started, beginning around 1980. Nurses and doctors, you know, were thought of similarly then as they were as of COVID or because of COVID, right? So heroin also, same thing, just, you know, different um, sex. Uh, antagonist, well, what's the antagonist? So, you know, we see the anti or anti and 
One of the meanings of that is opposite. The person opposite to the chief sufferer. What that really means is the person causing. Darth Vader is the antagonist to Luke. Han is sometimes an antagonist to Luke. Okay? But Darth Vader is the simple one. Again, the antagonist can be a thing, not a person. Now, what's the antagonist, first Star Wars film, when Luke is in his X fighter and he's, you know, they're trying to destroy the Death Star. Is it really the fighters from the Death Star that are coming out? Kind of. But what's really the antagonist? You get them making their runs, and every now and then the screen goes back to, we will be in range within 35 seconds, 34, 33. Time is the antagonist. You better hit that sucker before everything blows. Okay. So notice, the force that opposes the protagonist. Okay. It can be a person, it can be a place, it can be a thing. Okay, Suspense, everybody knows what that is. Climax, it's the literal textbook definition, modus, moment of greatest emotional tension. What's the climax in the third Empire Strikes, uh, Revenge of the Jedi, Return of the Jedi, whatever the title is, Star Wars film. With the moment of greatest emotional tension. It's when Luke is calling out to Darth Vader, Father, save me! Because the Emperor is, you know, hitting him with the blue lightning, and Darth Vader looks at his son being tortured, and he looks at his master, and he looks at his son, and he looks at his master. And you can kind of do a pause there and go, what will he decide? Because it's a knife, it's a cliffhanger. What? Think cinematically, think, you know, uh, culturally in terms of how movies affect society. How would that story change if Darth Vader said, No, I love my master more than you. Kill him, you know. And he didn't destroy the emperor. I would lay money on the table that Star Wars would not go down as one of, you know, the, the original trilogy would not go down as one of the greatest, you know, things in film history. I think an awful lot of people would be really severely pissed at that point. Okay? So that's this. So notice you have this rising action, you have this pyramid structure, and then you get oh, way too much time. The falling action. Okay? Because once you reach this, all the suspense is built up here, and then uh, everything starts to unravel. And you know, notice this kind of looks like you know you have a degree in terms of the grade, the climb. Well, this isn't necessarily. I mean, I'm drawing essentially an isosceles triangle, right? Three equal sides and angles. It, it doesn't necessarily work that way. Sometimes, you know, the pyramid may, may, or triangle may look more like that. Long, slow, rising action with complication. And then you get the climax and boom. Story ends very, very quickly. Okay? So that's, you know, here... The resolution or the denouement, the resolution, how it is resolved. Well, where is that? Let's say again in that third Star Wars film. Darth Vader does destroy the Emperor, and pretty much everything after that, it's fluff, man. Other than Luke taking Darth Vader, trying to get him on his ship, and he says, No, Luke, but I want to save you. You have saved me. You can pretty much cut to the credits at that point. You don't have to go and have this stupid little party with the Ewoks, and we see the trinity of, you know, Yoda and Obi-Wan and Anakin Skywalker, you know, hovering off in the distance, you know, and Luke has to reveal to Leia, you know, we're twins, blah, 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 all that kind of stuff, okay? Um, all right, all that stuff. Now let's go to...
Minister's Blackmail, which we've got 20, 25, 22, 27 minutes. We might build it. Notice, it's a parable, Hawthorne tells us. What is a parable? What should immediately, I can't ask this question anymore, but I'm going to. I used to be able to ask this question when I was 12. Because the culture was different 30 years ago. What should immediately come to mind when you hear that word parable? Or who should immediately come to mind? Jesus. He's the most famous parable teller there was. Okay. Page 331, if you haven't. I do have the right book, right? 11th edition, 331. Um, Jesus spoke in parables. So if you go back to the Bible and look at parables, if you've got an earlier edition, hold on a second, it's three, 389 in the 10th edition. Um, what often happens after Jesus tells a parable? People go. Usually the disciples. Huh? What did it mean? Explain to us the parable of the mustard seed. Explain to us the parable of the leavened bread versus unleavened bread. Explain to us. And Jesus always tells them when they ask, and sometimes even before they ask, he says, you're wondering what I meant. You should know by now. But then he goes on and says, to you it is given to know. And he explains to the disciples. Often he begins a parable or ends a parable with the phrase, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. So what does that mean? You got to have the right hearing. You have to have your radio tuned to the right frequency. And yet, you know, sometimes the disciples say, why do you speak in parables? And why do you make the parables clear to us, but you don't care to anybody else? He says, because if I made the parables clear to everybody else, they would understand. Well, what does that mean? You know, and literally, what does that mean? Because you have scholars and Bible critics, etc., still today going, hmm, not exactly sure. Yeah. Is that the same as an allegory? No. Uh, for the simple reason that in an allegory, if there's if there are any symbols or images used in the allegory, they only point to each symbol or each image will only point to one thing. So the example I think I used the other day, John Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress, written in the 17th century. The protagonist there is a guy named Christian. Okay. Christian only stands for Christians. You can't read Pilgrim's Progress and say that Christian means Muslim. And that if you're Muslim and you read this and you follow this, you will find your way to Allah in heaven. Doesn't work. Okay? It, I mean, when I say it doesn't work, I mean the story breaks down if you try to do that. It can only refer to that. Similarly, you know, and, and talk about the section on symbolism. The Christian cross can, as a literary symbol, can only and ever refer to Christianity, Christian, the Christian idea of salvation and such. The Star of David doesn't refer to Hindus or doesn't suggest Hindus. So that's how an uh, allegory works. With a parable, you've got multiple possible meanings. And that's the difficulty of it. Because a parable is a story designed to get a message across without the message being explicitly told. Notice, it's designed. It has a message or meaning or point or theme. Okay? The, um, yesterday in our church, an Orthodox church, the reading is from Gospel of Matthew, and it's the parable of the of the um, 
it's not the parable of the talents, that's a different one. Parable of the guy who forgave, you know, somebody who owed him off, the king. The king had a bunch of servants, and he called, you know, one servant to him, and this servant owed the king 10,000 talents. And the king said, pay up. And the guy said, ah, I can't, I don't have the money. Well, then I'm going to throw him in jail. The guy falls on his face and begs for mercy, and the king shows compassion. And he says, don't worry about it. Your debt is forgiven. Okay, 10,000 talents. A talent is a weight of gold. All right? In the biblical time, a denarii, a denarius, is the amount of money you would make for one day. A talent is like 100 denarii. He owed 10,000 talents. So you make 100 denarii by working 100 days. How many days does it take to work to get 10,000 talents? More than you can live. <laughs> right? And he just wipes the slate clean. So that guy who gets his slate wiped clean then goes and says to a servant of his, you owe me 100 denarii. 100 days wages. Pay up. The guy says, I don't have the money. And he says, foul rotten servant, I'm going to throw you in jail until you pay the, and then the King James translation, you know, the uttermost farthing, like they used English money back in Jesus' time, right? So some of that servant slash slave's friends go to the king, and they say, the guy whose 10,000 talents you forgave just threw in the jail somebody who owed him 100 days wages. The king has him brought before him. It says, you dirty, rotten son of a... I forgave you 10,000 talents, and you wouldn't even forgive this other guy who owed you a spit in the ocean compared to that? You're going into jail. And then he explains what's the message, what's the meaning of the parable. If you forgive others... God will forgive you. So, if you don't forgive others, then what happened to the guy who wouldn't forgive the one who owned a little amount is going to happen to you. You'll be thrown into outer darkness and there will be weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. Okay? That's the parable. Hawthorne tells us this is a parable. So that means we have to have ears to ear and eyes to see and we're not going to get an explanation, okay? So, you got a little, the little you know, thing down at the bottom, Hawthorne's note, we're told, okay? And I've got check. I don't even know how I would check, but Hawthorne's note tells us that something similar happened 80 years ago in York, Maine, okay? My gut feeling is the note is probably a fiction. It's probably not true. Because Hawthorne does that with some of his stories. Scarlet Letter begins here in our real world at a place called the Custom House where he, Nathaniel Hawthorne, is working, and he did work in a custom house, and he says, I found this manuscript. It's the most amazing thing. And so I'm going to publish it. And so he creates this fiction that the events of the Scarlet Letter really happened. They did it. Uh, J.R.R. Tolkien does the same thing with The Lord of the Rings. The Lord of the Rings is actually supposed to exist, the story, in a book called The Lord of the Rings, or The History of the Ring, etc., begun by Bilbo Baggins. He writes his part. He goes off. Frodo writes his part. Sam Gamgee writes his part, etc. Okay? So, the sexton stood in the porch of Milford Meeting House. Notice, it's not called a church. Why? Not because it's not Christian. More than likely, not, it's not explicitly made clear. More than likely, this could be a Quaker church because the Quakers refer to their church buildings as the meeting house, okay? So, and he's ringing the bell. Why? Because the bell tells people, get your you-know-what's to church. 
it's time to time to show up. And the people start coming along. Notice the old people stooping and such, children tripping merely beside their children, their parents, you know, running and such. And the sexton cries out, but what is good person who forgot upon his face? And then turns, you know, think cinematically, that turns, whereas the camera has been panning all the members of the village slowly and quickly making their way, it focuses our attention right on one person. And they beheld the semblance of Mr. Po Mr. Hooper pacing slowly his meditative way toward the meeting house. Now, pacing slowly his meditative way. What kind of narration is that? If you go back to the section on how narrators can narrate, the narrator has just done something. He's or she has editorialized. That is, they have commented on Parson Hooper. They've told us this guy is meditative. What does that mean? Does that mean, you know, when he goes back home, he gets in the lotus position, puts his hands up? Nope. Like slow and relaxed. Slow and relaxed, thoughtful, deliberative. That is, he's not rushing. He's just taking it easy. But meditative implies this guy's always thinking. There's always something going on in his mind, okay? With one accord, they started, that is, all the people of the village kind of like jump. They're startled by what they see, expressing more wonder than if some strange minister were coming to dust the cushions of Mr. Hooper's pulpit. Are you sure it is our person? Inquired Goodman Gray. Goodman is an old Puritan term to, you know, used to describe in, let's say, you know, kind of an elder statesman of the village, an older gentleman who's highly respected. Of a certain and his good person, Mr. Hooper, replied the sexton, he was to have exchanged pulpits with Parson Shute of Westbury, the Parson Shute sent to excuse himself yesterday, being to preach a funeral sermon. So he wasn't supposed to be here today. He was supposed to be somewhere else. But he is. And then we get this. The cause of so much amazement may appear sufficiently slight. Okay. Notice the narrator doesn't say the cause of such amazement is sufficiently slight. That is, they're all curious and they're all full of wonder and awe over something trivial and small. No. The narrator says, may here. Whenever you see this word, what should you automatically also kind of supply? It may not. If, if you might do something, what else does that mean? You might not do it. Okay? This is subjunctive, you know. And what that means is it's a condition contrary to fact. Shakespeare is famous for playing around with this theme, not theme, appearances versus, appearances versus reality. Every one of us does what daily? We appear one way, maybe to one person or one group of people, but then we do what? We appear differently to somebody else or to another group of people. How many of you exact? Uh, how many of you act exactly the same no matter where you are or who you're with? Probably don't. You probably act a little bit differently when you're in class than when you are with your friends or when you're in class than you are at work. Because 
the societal expectations in those groups are different. In other words, we all, and kind of jump to the end, we all of us kind of wear a veil. Or let me use a different example. We wear a mask. We mask ourselves. How many of you really, you know, from my standing up here, think you really know me? Nope. Will you at the end of 16 weeks? Nope. Would you at the end of 16 years? Nope. I can't even say that about my wife, whom I've known for 38 years. I don't fully, we will never fully know each other. Okay? So, it appears sufficiently slight. Mr. Hooper, a gentlemanly person of about 30, so he's not very old. I'm a teenager, might seem really old. Though still a bachelor, was dressed with due clerical neatness. Notice, there's an implication there. A preacher ought to be dressed neatly. There's nothing like, you know, in a lot of churches today where the preacher goes out with torn Levi's and a t-shirt that's untucked and hair kind of, you know, everywhere. This is, you know, he's wearing probably all black. He probably has a collar, not this kind of collar, but then the white one that goes between, okay? As if a careful wife had starched his band, that's the white thing that goes between, and brushed the weekly dust from his Sunday's garb. Why would he have weekly dust on his Sunday's garb, his clothing? Because it's been sitting in a closet for a week gathering dust. So the implication is, if he were married and he had a good wife, she would, before he got dressed Sunday morning, dust off the dust. Okay? There was but one thing remarkable in his appearance. Swathed about his forehead, hanging down over his face, so low as to be shaken by his breath, so it goes below his mouth. So it starts up here and comes down this far. It's not like those of you wearing a mask. Okay, because I can see her eyes. This is over the eyes. Okay. Mr. Hooper had on a black veil. On a nearer view, it seemed to consist of two folds of crepe, a really thin material. In, on a single um, unfolded would be translucent. You'd be able to see through it. But with it folded, you can't, okay? Which entirely conceals its features, except the mouth and chin. I don't understand how it, it moves with his breath if it's not over his mouth, but that's why I said it probably does go over his mouth. Um, but probably did not intercept his sight farther than to give a darkened aspect to all living and inanimate things. Pull out a dark piece of cloth, put it over your eyes, a single layer, and you can still make things out through it. So if you ever, you know, do a party game or something like that, and you've got to be blindfolded, what do you do with the blindfold? Every time. You fold it multiple times to make sure somebody can't see through it. So notice we're told he probably can see through, but what does it do? It darkens everything he sees. With this gloomy shade before him. The term gloomy and shade could have as easily said, with this shady gloom before him. Why? They both mean essentially the same thing. With this shady shade or with this gloomy gloom before him, meaning the darkened world that he sees in front of him. Good Mr. Hooper walked onward at a slow and quiet pace, stooping somewhat and looking on the ground as is customary with abstracted men. Okay, so he's kind of stooped and hunched over and he's looking at the ground. Hamlet, you're going to see when we get to it, his mother's going to say, you know, or his father, stepfather, is going to say, you know, why are you always looking at the ground? You know, they talk about his veiled lids, eyelids. And what they mean by that is, we can't see your eyes, 
Because you're always looking down at the ground. Well, what can you see if you look at somebody whose head is slightly tilted and they're looking at the ground? All you can see are their eyelids, right? So, as is customary with abstracted men, abstracted, living up here, thinking about problems up here while going about their daily business, yet nodding kindly to those of his parishioners who still waited on the meeting house staff. So as he gets up, he sees people. As he comes to the meeting house staff, he sees people. Maybe they say something, and he nods. In other words, he's not totally up here. Okay, He's, he's still aware of what's going on. The sextant. I can't really feel as if good Mr. Hooper's face was behind that piece of paper. What? Let me think about what that means. Where does face go? He's saying, I... Is this an apparition? Like a ghost? <clears throat> an old woman. I don't like it. He has changed himself into something awful. How? Only by hiding his face. It's it. Just by this, he's become something Awful. What does that word literally mean? And what does she mean by it? Does she mean its literal meaning, or does she mean kind of its modern meaning? Its modern meaning is horrible, detestable, scary. Its original meaning is full of awe. Something you would see, and you would almost go, wow. Be totally amazed by it. it. I think it's pretty clear she means the former. Okay? It scares her. Our parson has gone mad. Okay, now notice what's happening. Has Parson Hooper uttered a word? No. Has he done any? I mean, act, physically, actually, actively done anything? No, he hasn't. He just showed up one day with a black handkerchief over his face. And what are the people doing? Freaking out. They're freaking out. Modern psychologists would say they're demonstrating what? Mass hysteria. Okay, possibly mass hysteria. They're projecting, folks. They're projecting something from themselves onto him. In other words, he's not the real cause of their fear. He's the trigger, okay? So, all the congregation is astir as he comes in. Few could refrain from twisting their heads. So he's not even come into the church building yet, and everybody inside in the pews turns around and looks because it's like word from outside on the porch comes inside Everybody turns to see him as he comes in. He appeared about five lines down. He appeared not to notice the perturbation of his people. That is, they're perturbed. They're all distressed. He entered with an almost noiseless step, bent his head mildly to the pews on each side. And we kind of get this impression, this is what he normally does. He walks up the center aisle. He nods to people on both sides. Okay. Bowed as he passed his oldest parishioner. The bowing is a mark of respect, mark of honor. Who occupied an armchair in the center of the aisle. It was strange to observe how slowly this venerable man, venerable, what does the word venerable mean? Able to be venerated or Deserving of veneration. And that means not worship. Okay? It doesn't mean worship, but it means according a certain amount of respect and honor. They're talking about Parson Hooper. This guy is worthy of this kind of respect, right? This venerable man became conscious of something singular in the appearance, uh, this old guy, sorry, 
became conscious of something singular in the appearance of his pastor. He seemed not fully to partake of the prevailing wonder till Mr. Hooper had ascended the stairs and showed himself in the pulpit face to face with his congregation. Notice, except for the black veil. Why, why that phrase, except for the black veil? Because he's not face to face, right? Their faces are all uncovered. I hate it when everybody was wearing masks because I couldn't get any facial reactions. I, I couldn't. You know, and, and now studies are finally starting to come out. Babies through toddler age, through four or five years old, developmentally, they're like two years behind where they ought to be. Why? They didn't learn as they were learning to speak, to understand facial reactions. Really, really key for human development, okay? So, face to face, except for the black veil. The mysterious emblem was never once withdrawn. We're gonna stop in just a minute, okay? Don't worry about the syllabus, just keep reading with what's on the syllabus. Well, I've got the syllabus, but we'll catch up without any problem. That mysterious emblem was never once withdrawn. Two important words there. Mysterious and emblem. What is something if it's mysterious? What's a mystery? Unknown. Uh, the old TV series, probably none of you, all you guys fortunately are too young to remember it, Murder, She Wrote, with Angela Lansbury. It's about, you know, a woman who solves crimes. Okay? I just gave it away. She solves crimes. They're not mysteries. A mystery is something that cannot be solved, cannot be intellectually worked out, all right? So this is a mysterious emblem. What's an emblem? Some of you have some on the clothing you're wearing. Everybody knows what that emblem is, right? It's the Nike swoosh. What's it mean? Okay, why Nike? Who was Nike? Goddess of victory. You put on the emblem. You too will be victorious, you know. Okay. Um, I need to make a note here. We're going to stop there. Okay. So, real, real quick. I will get that sample quiz up today. Um, we'll finish this definitely on... Wednesday and get started on um, Faulkner. I'll probably Wednesday put up a quiz over this pull, uh, play. But don't worry about that. Just the one um, over the terms and such. All right. Wake up.